grew up in the 60s. But um, I wanted you to explain to people out there that might not understand the difference from just being from a neighborhood and being active in that neighborhood. Because I don't think people understand the different, you know, different yeah. status that people could have. Yeah. I mean, like we just said, like, <clears throat> if you were an active gangbanger and you really, really on your shit every day, you know what I mean? It's a different, it's a whole different lifestyle. You waking up, doing your thing, homie. Going in and know, crossing your line. You know what I'm saying? You probably banging on every nigga you run across, asking niggas where they from. They say the wrong hood, you might get off and get cracking, bust on a nigga. Like, niggas know what an what a active member out here do. Now, if you just, if you from your area, whether you from it and you never been active, whether you've been active before and you fell back due to whatever reasons, you know what I'm saying? And you moved on to something else, which is my scenario. Like, I do, I do music. I'm chasing a goal. I'm, I'm pursuing, I'm pursuing my dreams. So, you know, what I mean, I'm realistic with myself. I see the steps you got to take, in the, in the work you got to put in, and that's what I do day to day. So it's certainly possible to be from a gang and not engage in criminal activity. Most definitely, but I mean, some of the laws in California have been twisted to where just being from a gang is the crime. So, you know, what I mean, if you're around your homies and your homies, your, your hood happen to be under an injunction, being around each other is a, is a violation of. of, of you know what I'm saying, a, a law. So in some circumstances, they creating laws to, to be something that beforehand wouldn't be illegal becomes illegal just because of your affiliation, like gang enhancements for your crimes. Now in 2003, your neighborhood was actually hit with an injunction. Uh, how did that affect people you know and the people that lived in that neighborhood? I mean, <clears throat> it had an a, 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 a immediate effect on, on, on the people that was placed under that injunction whose names was on it. And um, it made it to where, like I just said, like something that beforehand was was perfectly legal became illegal just based on they, they filed a complaint. And, you know, what I mean, now they got jurisdiction to take you to jail because you got a white T-shirt on or because you got a phone in your hand or because you're hanging out with two people you grew up with your whole life. Now, at the same time, it is a, it's a violent history from all gangs in, in L.A., you know what I'm saying? But like we said before, we not the, we not the cause of that. We the, we the, we the, the effect. You know what I'm saying? We, we just adapted and, 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 and took up a survival instinct, you know what I mean? So motherfuckers should have some type of consciousness of that when they create these laws and when they police our area. Okay, y'all, that's just to kind of get the ball rolling, right? To get you to uh, start thinking about gang injunctions and how they affect our communities, specifically brown yeah. and black communities, communities oh, of color. Um, and there's reason behind all of that. So we're gonna have our guest speaker today um, really speak to that. Um, and I'm gonna encourage all of you as always to take notes, to be active in the in the chat box, keep the chat box open um, and, and then be ready for conversation, for dialogue after. So be ready with your questions, be ready with your comments um, so we can engage in, in dialogue, okay y'all? So um, I'm gonna go ahead and let me just check for just a second here. Uh, let me see. Chavo, you with us before I introduce you? Francisco? Okay, I knew, I know he was going to step away to get some water, but um, let me, let me introduce real quick and then um, hopefully he'll make it back by the time I'm done. <laughs> so um, with us today is Francisco Chavo Romero. Francisco graduated from Cal State University Northridge in the year 2000 with a bachelor's degree in child development and taught for 10 years at Manuel Lopez Intermediate School in Oxnard. He has served as the California Director of Organizing for Witness for Peace Southwest and Events Coordinator for the Dr. Rodolfo Acuña Gallery and Cultural Center in Oxnard and is a member of Union del Barrio for the past 25 years. So with that, welcome um, Francisco, welcome Chavo. Um, thank you for being here with us today. Um, I know that we have some visitors as well from the cyber world out there in addition to our students oh, okay. that were really interested in, in this conversation today. So um, I'm really happy that you can be here with us and enlighten us with some information about gang injunctions and how they can be harmful to communities of color. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to you. Welcome, Ana. Yes, thank you. Um, saludos, uh, Professora, for inviting. Um, I think the fact that you, you, you've gone out of your way to invite uh, community organizers, activists, other educators into, into this learning space is really important because I, I think it connects the dots in relation to uh, theory and practice, right? Like what you're learning in the classroom and then you know how you could implement 
what you've learned or how it connects to you know your career or your organizing and activist um, you know uh, you know choices in, in joining movement work uh, beyond beyond the classroom. So I really appreciate that. I just want to say a quick salute. Gracias, hermano. Gracias. Um, yeah, so we're going to go ahead and, and begin this plática, begin, begin this conversation. Um, but before we do that, I'm just curious, and you can share if you feel comfortable enough, and I hope that we're providing a safe, safe enough space to where we are comfortable. Um, but have any of you or people that you know, or maybe in your neighborhoods, have had to deal with um, gang injunctions before? And, and you can either raise your hand like this, or you can use your reaction button to do this. Yeah, okay, so I see some hands in the air. Okay, very good. And so this means that you can actually speak to this as well, right, from your own experience. So let's see what kind of connections we can make. All right, okay, Chavo, I'm gonna go ahead and, and, and hand it over to you. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that um, my sound sounds okay. I just uh, was troubleshooting the mic situation earlier. Yeah, sounds good. Coming in okay. here. Okay. So would you like me to go ahead and kick off with the, the, the slide deck? Yes. Okay. All right. Great. So um, thank you again. I'm hoping that you're able to see the, the slide deck now. Okay, great. So uh, I'm gonna work to make this as interactive as possible. So at, at certain times I'll, I'll try to pause and, and make it more of a conversation dialogue style. I think that's always helpful. So. Uh, if you have a comment in, in any moment that I'm presenting and, or, or a reaction, um, just raise your hand and then I'll try to catch it or, or we'll get support uh, as a team here to call on you and, and keep it lively, right? Uh, versus just kind of um, talking at you, it's more of a dialogue. Although there is a lot of information here, um, I think um, we've um, organized the slides now in a way that really speak to the history of gang injunctions first. Uh, it, they're like connection to really the, the, a lot of the um, anti-black um, um, black codes and you know, Jim Crow segregation laws and anti-labor movement um, tactics that uh, the bosses or the state uses against poor people, uh, in particular, poor, marginalized, colonized, uh, oppressed communities, um, in particular, Mexicanos, indigenous people, um, black community. Um, and so here, uh, you know, we've entitled this presentation, Prisons Outside of the Walls, because in many ways, uh, injunctions, gang injunctions served um, as a open air kind of control mechanism for a sector of, of our community. And really, uh, beyond just those that are targeted through the court system and served with the injunction restrictions, it really puts a blanket across whatever barrio um, or neighborhood that, that is being targeted by the district attorney, local police agencies and beyond. Um, here uh, on, on the left, you see a graphic that, that we use for some shirts we made. Um, it has the Oxnard um, gazebo and, and it's, it was just a commemorative piece and we thought uh, we'd share it here. But also next to the uh, slide there is a map that came off as a kind of like a, a, a comic during the time in, in 2004, 2005, when the first injunction was uh, introduced in the Ventura County area in the city of Oxnard against one of the neighborhoods there, uh, La Colonia, and then later uh, again, Southside. And the, 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 this comic um, strip was really just saying, why are you on, why, why only restrict the movement of these people that you're targeting as gang members to particular parts of town? Let's just, uh, let's just open up the whole um, city or the whole county or even just the whole state and make it impossible for, for, for these targeted folks to move around. Let's see. Um, Oh yeah, that's right. It is. I'm um, just capturing some of the, the comments here. So our movement uh, to end civil gang injunctions and what we mean by end is just throwing them out completely as a way, as a legal means for police and district attorneys across the state to implement these. And we're almost there 
and and we'll go through some of the the legal the some of the new legal um, updates in this current period that have impacted uh, how uh, uh, what justifies the ability to be able to have these civil gang injunctions out in the first place. But we wanted to recognize that it it has been a movement of people. Uh, we we can't even begin to name the amount of people, local residents, targeted homeboys and homegirls, um, targeted Black community members from across the state that have been resisting gang injunctions since they were introduced. Of note, I wanted to just kind of put the some logos up that have several organizations that really played in, in, in our book an instrumental part in bringing the topic and the issue of civil gang injunctions to the forefront and then uh, bringing along and inviting the other wing because there's different wings of the movement. One of them is the community grassroots effort and the other one is the legal, the lawyers, the ones that are uh, in, in the courtroom battling out the legal justification to allow these to even exist. So uh, uh, just to mention them uh, out loud, it, you know, Cafe Ane, uh, Dr. Rodolfo Acuna Gallery Culture Center, Curb, Chicanos, Chicanos Unidas, Chicano, Chicanas Unidas, Todo Poder al Pueblo, Unión del Barrio, Urban Peace Institute, um, United Scholars, Poder in Santa Barbara, um, Danza Traloc Olin, uh, CIYJA, an immigrant rights youth organization, and then the Youth Justice Coalition. Particularly the Youth Justice Coalition, really for us in Oxnard, was the key organization in, uh, that we believe we connected with back in 2004, 2005, that was already organizing in LA. In that time, I'm now in the city of Los Angeles myself, but in that time, in, in, in the early 2000s, I was in this, live, uh, lived in the city of Oxnard. It was the uh, Youth Justice Coalition that really had a lot of the information that we needed to really understand what civil gag injunctions were and have played, the YJC has played an instrumental role in the legal battle as well, as you'll see. So uh, with, in order to not read these all here bullet points to save some time for dialogue, just wanted to highlight some key pieces here uh, as how far civil gang injunctions go back. As you can see, some of the first efforts to put these gang injunctions out went all the way back to 1987 uh, here in Los Angeles. Uh, one of them in particular, the first one was against the Playboy Gangster Crips. Then later, I want to point to this 1997 People versus uh, uh, Gallo uh, versus Acuna case. That, that I'm going to make a note of in the next slide. I wanted to connect it to there where you're at, at Cal State Channel Islands University um, and, and the local town of Oxnard, because Oxnard did not have anything like this until 2003, 2004, when it was introduced, um, it, it caught us by surprise. It, it was it was a it was a uh, a secret kind of move that was made by the local Oxnard Police Department, city leaders, and the district attorney. They they had organized themselves quietly and began the process of preparing the first civil gang injunction without any community input. And this was uh, really like a, a uh, um, you know, a backdoor way to get from, uh, uh, from not letting the community know ahead of time. Because one of the things that's important for police and district attorneys when they actually introduce an injunction is the element of surprise, because it gives you less time to react legally and organize a movement. So, uh, you know, as a matter of fact, we were, uh, we meaning the Cafe Ane uh, and, and Union del Barrio Committee on Rest of Rights, we were going through these series of trainings with the actual police department, because the police had recently killed uh, many uh, individuals, including one young man that was in the closet with, you know, on his knees and they shot him. So there was like a, a, a activists came out and community came out to protest. And it got so much so that the city of Oxnard invested um, hundreds of thousands of dollars to bring in a, 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 an organization to try to help the community talk to the police and, and try to, try to uh, dialogue about you know, how we, how we felt the police was a paramilitary force in our organization occupying and oppressing, you know, the rolling up on, on, on youngsters, putting them up against the wall. I'm not sure if anybody has ever seen this, but they actually would throw a, a blue screen, some call it now a green screen, 
right in the middle of the neighborhood in La Colonia and up against the wall and start taking pictures of homeboys, making them take off their shirts, show their tattoos like as they were getting processed into, into a county jail or something. So this is the type of situation that was existing during that time. Uh, um, you'll hear my son here in, in coming in and out. Um, so the Acuna case is very important. This is what allows legally daddy, daddy, for, daddy, daddy, for civil daddy, gang injunctions daddy, 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 to exist. Daddy, 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 um, give me daddy, one quick. That's Chavito, by the way. <laughs> um, sorry about that, but you know we're uh, working from home. You know we're in the middle of a of a you know pandemic, and 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 we're making it work though. You know, and as as a matter of fact, I'm blessed that uh, I'm able to work, and my family is here, and and uh, you know spending a lot of time with him. You know, uh, and and the family. So this case is super important. And I'm gonna pause and see if there's any questions because I. I I want to like talk for like five, 10 minutes and then pause. Uh, and please let me know when, when it's a good time to kind of like start wrapping up so, so I don't lose track of time. But this case, the California State Supreme Court gave authorization for injunctions to exist. But we want to make note that the first injunctions, the first uh, what we, what, like 1.0, 1. 1. right? Because right now we're at gang injunction 5.0. Gang injunctions 1.0 version, right? were very limited in, in their scope. It was, it was uh, limited to individuals that were named in the lawsuit. It was limited to a small square block area and, and it wasn't broad like the ones you're gonna see in a bit. Uh, this required a lot of work on the, on, on the part of the police district Daddy, attorney or Daddy, city attorneys, Daddy, right? Daddy. Um, because they actually had to go one by one and prove that every single that daddy, every daddy, single daddy, individual daddy, that they were adding daddy. was an active gang member, was contributing daddy. to the nuisance, daddy, daddy, and daddy, was, uh, daddy, give me a quick second. That's the life, y'all, but I hope you're, I hope you're taking notes, everyone, and that you- Yeah, yeah, getting yeah. Getting yourselves ready for discussion and questions and all that, okay? Right on, thank you so much for, for your patience, everybody, and, and your love and, and empathy here, right? No worries. Um, so, so, so I want to pause there because this, this, uh, this is like the, the first step in um, giving access to the, the police uh, to implement these. Is there any questions up until this point? Don't be shy, y'all. Go ahead and unmute yourselves. Let's hear your voices if you have any questions or comments. Anybody? Did you ever experience um, these injunctions, like when it happened in Oxnard, or like or anywhere where you where you were at that time? Yeah, great question. Uh, we thought when these came out, and 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 coming up, you're gonna see what it takes to be labeled a gang member. We thought that we're all gonna that m many of us qualified to. Um, get put onto these injunctions, right? Because the, the criteria was so minimal that so many people that we knew uh, could be thrown into that category of gang member. I think we believe that because the movement was so strong that the police and the district attorney and city attorney had to take a step back and think really hard about who they wanted to add versus just kind of blanket add folks right off the bat. Uh, but uh, me personally, I was not served. The, the way we found out about this injunction was a surprise press conference that the police had with the district attorney and city officials uh, there in Oxnard. Then we got a call from the media. As a matter of fact, it was the media, the local Ventura County Star that called us, call, called me, because during that time, uh, Comedia Raza Rights, we had a big campaign called Stop the Militarization of Our Community Campaign, where we were saying, we didn't want AR-15s or tankers or anything like that in our neighborhood. Um, and, and so they, th they said, let's contact this organization, speak to Francisco and get a quote. And I knew very, I knew a little bit about injunctions at that when they called me. So I was able to comment, but once I hung up, I started calling around and asking people, what is this in a deeper way so we could organize ourselves. Then because our name was published in the paper, a lot of the homeboys and the homegirls that were getting targeted started calling us or their relatives, right? Their parents 
because juveniles were served and or uh, you know people that were actually served like directly they started coming to us and they came with the actual paperwork and you know it was like uh, about that thick it was about a thousand pages they they would give the police would show up to the people that were targeting and would hand it to them so they called us we went to the cafe on a um, dr uh, rodolfo acuna um, cultural arts center that was formerly there on a street it's not there currently um, and so, so people started, we started having community meetings with everybody that was specifically targeted because it, this movement is led and was led by those that were targeted. You know, they were the ones that were in the front line. We were, we were supporting them. So that's a great question. Okay, uh, maybe I'll proceed and I'm gonna go a little quicker because uh, I wanna make sure we get to some of the, the, the updated slides. So, you know, what is a gang injunction? So a gang injunction is actually a, a restraining order that prohibits uh, gang members uh, named or as an unincorporated, unincorporated association from participating in certain activities. It is based on the legal theory that gang activity constitutes a public nuisance that prevents non-gang members from enjoying peace in their community. Earlier, I had mentioned the Acuna case. So the nuisance that was happening in the four square block area, I mean, four corner, not even four square block, four corners. It was the situation there in San Jose for, for the Acuna case that I mentioned earlier was where, you know, this one particular corner was where a lot of the activity was happening around drug sales and violence. And it was pretty intense, right? Uh, and so, so the nuisance, was to the gang injunction was implemented to stop it, those individuals from going to that four corner area. So they put a little map and they said, you can't come to this area because you're causing a nuisance, right? And so, because nobody, none of the people that were targeted in the Okunia case in the nineties lived inside that, that zone. They actually came from other parts of the, uh, of the city of San Jose and beyond and gathered there. Now, the next step, which is the, the, the new version of, of, um, of the uh, gang injunctions takes it a step further and we'll talk about you know, what that means. And by the way, we, I, I will be providing your professor with a copy of this and with some links for you to like kind of look into it a little deeper um, uh, later, right? If you're of interest and also provide my information if you wanna contact me directly. So this, this little slide here, what it talks about is how it works, right? How the police gathers the data, the crime statistics, et cetera. To, to, and I wanna thank um, uh, Gabriela, uh, Gabby Hernandez from, and Chicanos, Chicanas Unidas from uh, Orange County for, for providing this particular slide because it's a nice visual of the steps of what it takes to implement an injunction, right? All the way from the beginning of gathering the data to taking it into the courts to you know, getting a judge approval to then activating the injunction. So what is a, a gang member? You know, what does it take to be labeled a gang member? So for, uh, during that period, the, uh, the criteria is, is as shown here. One, that a reliable source tells the police department that you're a gang member. What, what does that mean, right? It could be very broad. Somebody that they, you know, that they're working with, somebody that they pressure into saying, hey, that person's an active gang member, which may or may not be true, right? Uh, it's just that person said it, we write it down on our card, and that's one kind of out of the, you only need two of these, five to qualify actually to get put into, into a gang database and then, and then possibly into an injunction. If you're arrested in the company of known gang members, so you, know, you may be driving in a vehicle, headed, Wherever you get pulled over, the person in the vehicle is an active gang member. They pull you out, they take names. You are now associated with an active gang member, even though you may not be doing any active you know, criminal activity, et cetera. Because recall, it is not illegal. It is not unconstitutional to be a member of a gang. You know, um, it's actually, you know, there isn't the, 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 the what is uh, unconstitutional, I mean, what is a crime is the actual crimes that you commit, right? But being a, you could be from your barrio and, and claim it. It's just that you, if you take it further around, you know, 
uh, you know, escalated into breaking the law, then that becomes a different story, right? Corresponds with known gang members. So this one is if you have a relative, you know, a cousin, what have you, that is in lockdown and they have been labeled a, a gang member and you're writing to them, you are being monitored and tracked. And not only corresponds like old school, you know, writing letters to, to your family, right? And sending it in, but also virtually, right? The whole social media world, uh, if you're, you know, police uh, infiltrates a lot of the social media under cover, uh, fake profiles all the time. And they're watching to see who's communicating with each other and connecting those dots and putting you into these categories, right? And then another one is just simply being in a picture with known gang members. I mean, this could be up until the point like you're at a quinceanera, they take a big picture of the whole family and there's a, a, a gang member there and you're there, they put you in there. They could actually tie that. Right? Like, hey, they're in a picture together. They're probably, um, they're probably you know, connected, right? And then the other one is self-admission. This is when you know, the police, they're, they're very savvy in the sense of like, they'll come up to you and ask you a question in a certain way. They, they connect with you. They try to get at you like, almost like pretend that you're, that you're friends, but they're, they're gathering uh, intelligence. And if you say, yeah, you know, hey, you, if the cop asks you, hey, you still down there, you know, kicking it at La Colonia? Like, yeah, yeah, you know, still there. That could potentially be used. Hey, they are self-admitted that they're still in the neighborhood, that they're still in a gang member. That it could be something like that. Another one is self-admission. You know, 95% um, of the convictions happen because people take a plea bargain. And a lot of the times a plea bargain, you have to admit that you're a gang member in order for you to get a reduced sentence. And a lot of folks, they just, they want to not do be in jail. So they'll sign the document and they just activated themselves as a gang member. So I'll pause there if there's any questions. So there's a lot, there are a lot of comments in the, uh, in the chat. Because uh, a lot of, you know, folks are like, what is that? Is that for real? So, uh, yeah, just unmute y'all. Like, well, what are you all thinking right now? What's, what are you processing? How are you reflecting on this? And uh, is it, is this new to you or what's surprising you about this? So if you can go mm -hmm. ahead and share. Wait, so like if you're hanging out with your cousin that she's from a gang, you could get arrested or what? What the, what the police, uh, Joanna, right? Joanna, what the police yeah. do, what the police do um, is, and, and there's a mention of it in a slide later, but I'm, I'm gonna go through that slide. So I'm glad, I was gonna kind of skip that slide. I'm glad that you asked that question. The police are always taking notes, right? They're writing on their pads. They have, they have what they call a gang field identification card, right? And they're always taking notes and writing reports. What, what I was mentioning earlier is that if you are arrested, if you're, if you're pulled over, I was, the example I used was if you're pulled over, let's say you run a red light and they stop you and somebody in the vehicle, they see as already a gang member and you're with them. And you know, you're not doing any criminal activity. You're just driving somewhere. They pull you out, you know, and they take pictures of you. They write a note in their card saying, so-and-so, Joanna was with uh, Juan, uh, Juan X, who is an act known active gang member. Let's put her in the associate category. So you start getting closer, you're an associate, then you're a member, right? They could throw you, they, you start switching. And a lot of the times it's very minimal evidence that is needed in the courts to, to, to prove that you're an associate, thereby connected to a gang, right? Even though they're, they're family members or even a friend, right? Oh my God, that's scary. Can this also be part, like, you know, when you, I didn't know, and um, thank God I, I got out of the store, the weed shop. Um, I was buying weed and um, and I someone my friend did tell me that if the cops are there, like everybody gets arrested. But um, I don't know if it's the same thing as this. It's a, li it's a, it's a little different because you know the 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 uh, there's a, there's a whole set, and as a matter of fact, that would be a great further presentation. We're working here in LA on that question around, you know, the new legislation around cannabis, because now now cannabis is uh, legal, you know, for recreation. But for so many years, m many people, especially people, poor people, um, black people, Mexicanos, 
uh, working class people were targeted, right? So yeah. it's kind of like this whole new world of like, what is legal? What isn't legal? What are my rights? What, what am I violating any? So I would make a marker of that and come back and maybe do, uh, I, I could connect uh, your professor with some experts that we work with here in Los Angeles that are working on this. So um, any other, thank you again, Joanna. Any other yeah. thoughts? Uh, Karen From, had a question, uh, go for it, Karen. Oh. Um, it's more of just like a comment because this is very new to me. I wasn't aware that even if you have no association to gang members, but you happen to be, you know, in the same location as one that you could be affected, like, like that seriously, like where they can like arrest you and all that stuff. But um, like, I don't, I don't know anybody, but let's just say like for a person who may not know this, because I feel like we aren't taught this like about our rights what could somebody do in a situation let's say like like the professor said like even a parent who could just be riding around in a vehicle with their child um like what are their rights somebody who's not affiliated at all but just happens to be in the same photo or you know the same car like that's insane to me yeah there's a, there's also actually we have um you know, Youth Justice Coalition, and now Chicanos Unidos. As a matter of fact, one of the uh, guest speakers later in the series for, for uh, your professor is um, Carolyn Torres. Um, she's gonna be talking about politics and elections, but she was deeply connected and it continues to be connected to Chicanos Unidos, which has and Youth Justice Coalition who have legal clinics. So there's actually recorded legal clinics where you could just listen and, and hear your rights. But there's also ways that you could connect because when you start talking about, you know, getting put into a list and things like that, the one of the best things, which, you know, is most helpful is to consult, right? With a, a legal representative, an attorney, just to get a co consultation, right? And, and they guide you through because it's a very slippery slope, the whole legal matter. So I, we always recommend that one, you brush up and learn and, and connect with people that have that information around your legal rights. But also, if it gets to that point that it's serious to consult with an attorney, right? Because the attorney is really the only one that is legally uh, able to give you advice, right? Like our recommendations are simply recommendations at that level. Uh, but when you start talking about the risk of being deprived of your rights in any way, meaning like, you know, getting on probation, getting put in jail, um, you know, things like that, then, then that, that elevates the situation. So um, hopefully that, that gives a, a little bit of context. And I just have another really quick question. Is it the same with ex-gang members? That's the thing, right? Um, the thing is, who decides that, that you are an ex-gang member? According to the police and, and the Junctions as they were written, because at the end of this presentation, I would talk about some of the updates. You pretty much were in this junction for life, and and there was no way to get out of it. And it was very, I mean, th there was a way, but it, that will that one of the avenues was virtually impossible. The other one was for as far as gang injunctions was for you to move, right? And which was part of the plan. Maybe maybe what uh, I think there was one. Maybe we could take one more comment. Because I think we have about uh, 25 more minutes or oh, so. Hey, we're, good. Um, we're good with time. I think um, Brittany was next. Is that you, Brittany? Um, no, this is Miriam. Oh, um, Brittany had her hand up. So let's have, oh, okay. uh, let me see. Hold up. I think she might be. Yeah, Brittany, if you want to go ahead and unmute. I know you've been waiting. Oh, yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I mostly just had a comment um, about that basically brought up the thought of um, this incident that happened with my partner. He's not in a gang, but um, like he gets racially profiled a lot because we live in Moore Park and um, he's been pulled over before, like just randomly for like no reason. And um, the police will like take a, they've taken a picture of him and said, you look like somebody who we were looking for, but you're not that person. And then they'll let him go. But I, it just made me think of that because you talked about how um, police will take pictures of people. And I don't think that, like, in my mind, I'm like, that can't be legal. So I'm wondering um, if you had any comments maybe about how he can kind of um, counteract 
um, him being racially profiled, I guess, by the police in an incident like that, or how somebody could do that? It depends. Uh, that's an excellent question. Some people choose to just, you know, let it go, right? Like, I am not going to engage. Some people choose to engage. Uh, one way to engage is to publicly put it on blast, right? Like, go on the record, um, put it on, hey, dude, this cop is, you know, kind of like put bringing some social media attention to the issue. So, so then the police are like, whoa, this person is like, you know, making some noise around this. Let's not, let's not like, let's not ruffle that person's feathers too much, right? However, that could result in retaliation, you know? Um, it's very, very well documented that if you speak up, there's, there, there's forms of retaliation in many ways, some of which, you know, I personally have experienced there in Oxnard. Um, but the other thing is there's, quote, um, what, what, I guess, uh, official mechanisms for you to say something. Each city police department has a complaint form process. Now, some people are like, I'm not putting a complaint form in because then that puts me on the radar. Some people are like, I'm already on the radar. I want to document that this is happening because the more people document officially the, that about one particular officer that continue or several that continue harassing, the more it comes up on their own files, right? And when the case gets to court or something like that, they'll be able to like, how many police complaints does this cop have? They'll say zero. They're like, then he's just a great officer, right? Where, where the reality is, might be totally different, where they, they're just because there is no written track record of it to prove that there's a history of this uh, racial profiling, uh, harassment, um, terrorizing even, because sometimes they just terrorize and scare you, right? So I'll pause there um, and, and maybe, maybe this would be a good point because um, maybe what I would like to do is go through the next series and then, and then pause again and then maybe end with that more, a little more of that dialogue. Cause I think some of the questions that you're bringing up might be, at, or you're thinking might be addressed in, in some of the other um, slides. Would, would that be a good idea? It, so, it sounds good, let's do that. Okay, and maybe we'll do it twice, right? Cause um, sure. uh, I see that we, we have some time. Yeah. So what has happened? So when we came out against the injunction, people were like, well, why are you protesting this? Do do, are you on the side of gang members that are causing problems and, you know, dealing drugs and killing people, right? I mean, people attacked us. We said, what we're against is the process of which you're blanketing everybody. And we're also saying to you, the, the police department, the city officials, the judge, that a lot of the things that you're restricting are already illegal. So, if, you know, if, if, you know, most most folks would would test to, test to the attest to the fact, including those that were targeted. We're like, hey, you know, if I'm a person that is um, committing some sort of crime and I'm arrested, it's proven in the courts, et cetera, Then then I, uh, I'll I'll pay my dues to society. I'll do my time. I'll pay my fines. Whatever. However, what the injunction does, what the injunctions did was mask already illegal criminal activity on the books with things that are not illegal, right? Like for example, the ones here in yellow are the ones that we say were not illegal activity that were made illegal for people, right? So for example, associating with others, right? The association clause, if you're just hanging out and there is no criminal activity happening, then what's, what's happening? The injunction would say, if we see you together, just two of you, you're, that's it. Well, come up on you because what the injunction gives the police the authority to do is, is grab you, I'll put you in jail. You could, you know, you're definitely going to pay a fine up to $1,000 for each pop. And you could do up to six months in jail, depending, right? So that was crazy because, you know, we had family members, like brothers, right? One case in particular, they lived in the same apartment complex building in the same, you know, unit. They actually would have to time themselves like you go first, bro. The brother would leave, go to work. All right, 20 minutes later, all right, then I'll go because the police were outside waiting for him. And the, they would go that way. And they couldn't go to the park. They couldn't go to the movie theater together. Nothing within the injunction zone, right? That's just one example. 
The other one is the, the clothes. You know, the Dallas Cowboys was an of, official jersey or logo that you could not use. And in the case for South Oxnard, it was the White Sox, right? If you had any of those and you were in this injunction, that you, you would get violated, right, for, um, for this um, gang injunction uh, restriction. It just so happens, as you all may know, that during that time, and even now, well, right now, just due to the pandemic, it's not happening, but the Dallas Cowboys were training in Oxnard, right? So it was like this huge contradiction, right, where everybody could wear cowboy gears if they were cowboy fans, um, and, and the, these individuals could not, right? So it, it outlawed that. The last one was the curfew one. That was a big one because people, if we were coming from work or going to work and you were on this injunction and you were, it was past 10, it didn't matter in the beginning, but we challenged that. And actually the Oxnard, the Colonia Chicas versus Greg Totten, the, uh, the district attorney case was one of the first cases in all of the state of California that dealt with the issue of the curfew. So the work that we were doing and the attorneys that came in, there was multiple attorneys that came in pro bono, including the public defender's office, they came in and helped and led, you know, with other attorneys to take this all the way to the local appellate uh, circuit court, right? A three panel judge, right? Three judges said, hey, hey, this whole curfew, I mean, okay, some of these other things we're going to let go, but this curfew thing, this sounds of this whole, I don't know if, if, if in history you recall, they used to call them sundown towns. If you were black and it, that the sun went down, you better not be outside or you're going to, they're, they're going to come to get you, right? So it had similar reek of the, that smell of those Jim Crow laws. So the, the constitution is supposed to be protecting you from those kind of things. I'll move quickly. Can I just oh. speak on something real quick about the, of course, please. the football jerseys? Yep. <laughs> I just want to share a quick little story, y'all, because basically what this comes down to are all these uh, laws that, and policies and whatever they may be um, that are written and implemented through a, a colonial lens, right? Um, and one of our guest speakers, Dr. Seatley, had shared with you all that we've been dealing with violence um, since uh, colonization, right? And so this is yet another way to shape, um, like, like uh, Chavo's also saying, Jim Crow, right? So these are just new versions of the same kind of colonial um, and oppressive and criminalizing um, types of policies that are put out there. And so again, you know, we're dealing with the criminalization of black and brown bodies and working class people. Um, and that's what it comes down to. But I wanna share a story about um, the, the football jerseys cause I'm a, I'm a Raider fan. So I'm gonna wear my Raider jersey. And, you know, I was a, a teacher for a long time at an elementary school and there was a, a student in another classroom who I was on recess duty and the student was sitting down on, on the bench where you have to sit there when you're in trouble, right? When you got in trouble for something. And I happened to know this um, first grader, uh, I happened to know his family, his parents um, and they're Raider fans too. And so this little boy was in trouble and, and he was looking all sad and upset. And I said, hey, what's going on? You know, what's, what's happening? Uh, did you get in trouble? He's like, yes. And I said, well, what happened? He's like, oh, my teacher said that I'm wearing gang clothes. And I'm like, what do you mean you're wearing gang clothes? And then I noticed that he had his Raider sweatshirt turned inside out, okay? <laughs> so um, this is, you know, even in our schools, this is a first grader, he's a baby. And we have this grown person telling this child, you're a criminal, you're a gangster because you're, wet, you're a fan of a Raider football team. Okay, something that is so outdated and, you know, it's just ridiculous to me. Um, and so the next day, um, my daughter was going to the same school as well. So the next day, you know, I rolled up at work with my Raider jersey and my daughter had her Raider jersey and, you know, just to make a statement, you know, and I had to have a meeting with this teacher, this colleague of mine and the principal to say, you know what, these policies are criminalizing our children. And so are we really about that? Is that what we're really about? And I'm having this meeting as I'm wearing my Raider jersey, right? And my, and my daughter's walking around campus with her Raider jersey. I'm like, I dare somebody to put my daughter on the bench for that, you know? And so, and, and these are the things, right? Like Chavo was explaining before, like we have to choose, you know, whether or not we're going to speak up or, or not. But I wasn't about to walk away um, and let this little boy um, be down on himself and, and think of himself as less than what he's worth because this teacher already planted this poisonous seed in his mind. And that was just really upsetting to me, you know? So 
um, I had him put his sweatshirt back on and I said, I'm a Raider fan too. I'm going to wear my gear tomorrow. So wear your gear. I'm going to go talk to your teacher. And that's the way we have to handle it sometimes, you know? Um, so I just wanted to share that story. And, and, and really the, the main point here is that all these little things are used to criminalize uh, certain groups of people. And, and we have to push back on that. So thank you, Trevor. Palabra, much appreciated. And, and uh, I'm glad to hear that the profe um, had previously had described, you know, that, that the, there, there are uh, methods to containment, control, uh, oppression and repression, right? And, and, and they come in different forms. It's straight out brutality. And, and even, uh, you know, we've, as we've seen in history and even recent history, um, assassination, uh, you know, MLK, you know, he was assassinated for, for speaking out. So, so, I mean, it goes, uh, Malcolm X was, you know, they're gonna, they're hopefully gonna reopen his case because some FBI just this morning, you know, it was shared in, in uh, public radio that, 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 um, for Malcolm X, a, a local police um, officer left in his will, when I die, I want people to, to, to know the truth about what happened that day to Malcolm X. So that cop was given the, the order to take Malcolm X's security guys, the, the, his security reps, you know, his team and grab them like the night before and, and charge them and put them in jail to hold them so that Malcolm, when he was up on the stage could be all alone. And they couldn't like protect them, and that's and and that's just coming out. So so it, it could go from from harassment to to that, right? It's very extreme, but it's real. Um, so I appreciate that 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 reference to to the you know the colonial aspect of of, of that type of control. Um, you know, so when the injunction was uh, in, when injunctions are issued, you know, people there's this whole debate. There was this whole debate about. Well, they work. They do work. They get the gang members to stop doing what they're doing. The reality is that what happens is that when the injunction is issued, and this was one study that was done that shows when it was issued, there was a, a small drop in some aspects of crime. But then it goes right back up because what is not being addressed is the root causes of what turns youth to commit what we call uh, horizontal warfare against our own brothers and sisters, right? Like talk about colonialism to the point where, where you know, we, we are killing each other for territories, right? That, uh, that, that from land which was taken from us, right? And so, so this is the, the, how serious it is, right? So, so the issue at hand is poverty, you know, lack of jobs, lack of employment, lack of power, community political power to say, the solution is more investment into our communities, not a militarization, right? And, and so we have to, we are working uh, on a daily basis to, to try to build that type of community power and solve, you know, uh, most, of the, most of the violence that, that was taking place here in Los Angeles from the 90s to now, most of the violence was stopped because of the peace tr treaties between the neighborhoods because they, they started seeing, hey, you know, we're fighting each other, but our real oppressor is the state, the police re repressive forces in our community. Let's organize ourselves. Let's get political. Let's let's get organized, right? And that's really the the solution lies within within us, right? Community based, people power led solutions. It's a lot of work, but it's been historically uh, proven possible. So down to uh, let me do a quick time check. Um, okay, so. How did the map look in Oxnard? What you see here is one version. They call it a safety zone, the police and the district attorney. We call it a target zone because on the paper, they use the word safety zone, but in, in, in documents, original documents, it's really called the target zone. So they're even starting to use militarization language, right, in the community um, to get that us versus them war kind of strategy going, right? And so same map, a little looks a little different. What you see here is we tied the injunctions also to the push out or what people call the gentrification of neighborhoods, right? So here in this uh, light blue grayish color is the, the what is known as La Colonia, right? Here in the dark blue is what is the small downtown strip of downtown Oxnard. So part of the strategy of an injunction is to do one of three things. 
It's to tell people that are given this document and restrained to stay inside where nobody could see you. If you come outside, we're gonna take you and put you in jail where nobody could see you, right? And if you still don't do that, the only other thing you can do is move out of this town where nobody could see you here, right? Because part of the plan is to make the downtown uh, uh, area a certain uh, way for other people uh, to come and say, look how beautiful this town is. But in the back side, there's like push out, there's repression, police brutality, police terror, right? So that's very real and true. And, and more and more studies like at high levels, books are starting to come out on how these type of laws are a way to gentrify and push people out. Staples Center here in LA, where it's at, the first one of the first injunctions in LA against one of the Latino um, Central America Mexicano uh, gangs, what they put they put the injunction zone and kicked everybody out and then they built a staple center, right? And everybody got pushed out to the margins, right? And it's very real. Um, here's another map that we created using some of the census track. So in the dark in the really orange color is where all the Mexicanos live, right? And if you could see over here to the left. I think I have a pointer, yeah. Here on the left, this is the beach, right? So here's all, what color is this? Blue, so it's mainly white people, right? Here in La Colonia, it's definitely, you know, all Mexicanos, right, or Chicanos. And uh, same thing with Central Oxnard and then South Oxnard, right? This is Port Wainimi down here. So we wanted to show the two evolutions of, of the, so in the black is the bigger one against Colonia, the target zone, and in the green, is the second injunction against Southside. So, you know, we wanted to put put the, the race question into play here because it's it's uh, it's concretely tied to who is being targeted, right? There was not one single gang injunction against any white supremacist groups, let's just say that, All right? Let me go to the next one. Um, just a quick map in Los Angeles, uh, the capital of gang injunctions. Uh, here's a map of all the different injunctions. At one point, there was like 50, 60 active ones at one time. Um, I, and so it's, it's pretty serious around how much control they have all over the city. But with every, and, and here's San Diego, right? Another sample. And here's one of the neighborhoods in San Diego. Here's the other thing. When they say, hey, we're gonna put this injunction and we're gonna reduce crime. But remember earlier, I was saying that it gets, you get pushed out. So what happens every, in, this, in this example in, in, in Escondido, up there in San Diego County, down in San Diego County, um, they had to come back to the court and say, hey, you know, that gang injunction target zone, we need to make it a little bigger because, you know, these homeboys, they're starting to kind of move out of the target zone. So they kept kind of opening it, opening it, opening it. So again, not solving the question of, 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 of crime opportunities for our neighborhood. It was just like, push them out, you know, more. So all that to say is that people resisted, community resisted. Again, at the forefront was those being targeted during the time in, in Colonia and, and in Southside, a lot of the, the, the people that were targeted spoke up and they came down hard on them. Uh, they meaning the, the police department and the district attorney. Boom, boom, raid their houses, take them. Uh, we had one case where they busted one guy because his baby, you know, he was, he was trying to move on in his life from his youth, started a family, and his one year, not even one year old infant was in the cradle and had a cowboy, Covijita, you know, one of those like bear blankets as they call them, that had the cowboy star. The police raided his house. They couldn't find any single other thing that had Dallas Cowboys. They didn't find any weapons. They didn't find any drugs. But they said, hey, look at this. this there's a cowboy paraphernalia here boom he got busted and 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 he got busted because that not only did they raid his house they they went to his job and he lost his job as well so i mean it was pretty serious but people resisted and kept fighting uh community groups came and, and supported and we were out there here uh, all the way to sacramento and yolo county there was people fighting against these bay area hunters point la mission there was people organizing um uh, amazing work that came out for many years, we would go up and connect with the people in Santa Barbara because we started hearing in Santa Barbara, they, they might come up with it. So we said, hey, this is what we've learned so far. And then the Poder organization down there took it to the next level of organizing. 
And not only they, 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 they were one of the few, if I'm not mistaken, maybe one of two, maybe if not the only city that stopped an injunction from even going into place because they were able to organize, out organize the city and the police and politically won and, and legally won that battle. And, and they were able to, so that it started kind of crumbling, right? The whole plan. And that's what happened. I just wanted to um, just commend those forces that were there. And it was youth at the forefront of that. Then now comes what's happening in Oxnard. And then I'll, I'll finish with what's happening in LA and some of the new laws. So in the middle of all this, about four years ago, the, some cases came where they had to now, because earlier I mentioned that the police had to serve people. I mean, I didn't quite go into it, but the, the, in, in, that, in, that, um, in that slide, let me go right back to it, because I think it's important. Here, in this slide, when the people, when, when the judge approves it and the permanent, ju ju uh, the permanent injunction is um, uh, approved, then, then they start kind of like serving people, giving the people the injunction, right? So fast forward, now, before what they used to do is, for example, for the one in Oxnard, both of them, against Colonia and Southside, the police went to about 20 people or 12 people and said, hey, you're a member of this gang, you need to go tell the other members, all of them, right? And they said it was something like a thousand for Colonia and something like 500 for, for Southside. So you 20 or 12 people need to go tell everybody that they're going to court because all, you're all part of the same group. So some people would take the document and some would go and fight it. They would kind of like get out or they would lose the battle in court and the judge would approve it. Once the judge approved it, everybody else, even if they didn't show up to court to you know, have a day in court, were thrown into it. So that was the, what we call the due process issue that was there from the beginning where we, believe, we believed and, and what have not successfully won that you can't give somebody a representative to go tell everybody if, if they're not like a, a business or a, like a, a union. Because remember earlier I talked about that these injunctions or restraining orders are used against anti-labor. So when like unions are organizing and picketing the bosses, Let's say at Amazon, right? There's a lot of um, strikes and things going on because people are trying to unionize at Amazon. If the Amazon bosses say, these, these protesters are in the way, they go to court and they put a restraining order to push the people out so they can't block the driver or whatever. It's the same concept here. But there, you're, you have a card that says you're a member, the, the union representative gets it and there's an actual way that they all communicate with each other. They have their card carrying members. With, with, with the neighborhood, it's not like that, you know? We, we understand clearly that everybody's like, hey, this is my barrio, but they may not necessarily be like, uh, like deep into any uh, of, of criminal activity, et cetera. They're just from the barrio and they claim it proudly, right? So that's not the case now. And so what we started doing is going to the courts here and started doing court watches because they were trying to sneak one in and because the new legislation, and here's one of the court watch flyers where we would get like 12, 50 people to show up because we wanted the police and the judge to know that we were watching and that we were gonna uh, respond to whatever was happening. Kind of like, you can't sneak this bias, right? We're watching you. Um, so the way they try to sneak around in Oxnard, Oxnard was the only one that tried to do it and we caught them on it was, and again, it was because the newspaper called and said, hey, what do you think about this new ordinance that they're gonna to try to pass in Oxnard? We're like, which ordinance? So the attorney, uh, uh, Sean Garcia Leyes, you know, was able to say, hey, you know, there's this thing going on. We've seen the notes and we went down there and you see there uh, several speak people spoke. Um, and what we spoke about is, remember earlier where I said, and this will be the, I think one of the last few comments and then I'll, we'll pause, is the police now through the new legislation and, and I want to put those here, Vasquez versus Bukakis, People versus Sanchez, and Youth Justice Coalition versus LA. These three new cases that have went to the courts and won the rights back for every individual to have a day in court before they're put into an injunction. That which means that the police now has to do what they did back in the first case that I was talking about, the Acuna case in San Jose, where they actually had to tell every individual from the beginning that they thought they wanted to put into this injunction and give them a day 
to go in court versus what they were doing, giving it to like 20 and saying, go give it to everybody else. It's your job. Now the police have to work for, for trying to prove that the people that they're targeting are actually active gang members, right? Current active gang members, not gang members that they documented that were 16, 17, 18, now they're 25 and they're working. They left, you know, any type of connection, right? Um, and that's totally different. What the city tried to do is try to say, well, we don't have to have that hearing in the court. Let's have it in the city. And we'll have some random person chosen to kind of look at the file and we'll tell the person that we want to add to come. If they don't come, that's okay. They don't have to show up. We'll take care of it from there. And this is already something that one of the attorneys that you see here, uh, uh, Barbara Mac Ortiz, caught them on this and say, you know what? I, I've been in these before. There's some for taggers, for graffiti um, violations where they do this. And you know what? It's messed up. The, the way that it's set up is it, it's stacked up against the person to not show up. They make a decision. You're not, you never even knew. They say, yeah, we did. We put the paperwork, we mailed it to you, whatever, but they sneak around and we stopped them. This night that you see here, we stopped them and we said, you can't do this. It needs to be in the court. And sure enough, the council um, sided with us and said, you know, let's, let's slow it down. Let's, let's listen to the people. Let's talk about, even if we want these injunctions still 15 years later. Um, and sure enough, once it got kicked back to the court, the police, about a year later, they threw their hands up. They said, we don't even, the district attorneys forget it. If they're going to make us work to prove active gang membership, then for every single one, then it's not even worth it for us anymore. Because before it was just easier, right? We could just tell a few people and then get everybody. But they can't do that anymore. So that's why this is not happening in Oxnard anymore. There was an announce, announcement uh, late last year. They, they said, hey, sorry, we messed up. You know, there's no reparations. They're not talking about that yet. I think the community of Oxnard will, will have to continue that fight and say, hey, you know, for those 15 years that you did that, for each of those years, you owe us a million dollars in youth programming. Imagine that. And we're, we're going to cut it from the city budget, which you already have half the city budget anyways, right? And a million dollars is nothing. It's a, a change to them, right? So imagine, you know, so there's, there's potential for more movement building around this question around repairing what was done, right? And so these, these case law is the ones that I wanna to point to. If you Google them, they'll come right up and you could get deeper into it. Um, and I hope that you do and get into it because connected to this is so many things, civil rights, right? Movement building, there's law, there's criminal quote, injustice or criminal justice. There's so many elements depending on where you're going in your field of study that could, are connected to this one issue of gang injunctions. But uh, again, thanks to like, for example, one of the last case here in Los Angeles, they just, uh, the judge ruled Los Angeles must now do the same thing. So now what we're doing is making sure that all those uh, gang injunctions that I talked about earlier, all across the state are doing this because sometimes they don't tell people. So we're going to every city, Fresno, what are you doing? Yeah, Papa. My Pokemon stickers don't last for long. Let me check it out then, buddy. I'm gonna go, I'll go right now with you. Give me like two minutes. So I want to end with that by saying that that really there's that there is a way to struggle. There is a way to organize. You can make a difference in 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 making impact at the systems level. It takes sometimes it takes some uh, you know a few years. Sometimes you get an immediate win. Sometimes it takes 15 years, like it did for us in Oxnard. But you know the tools of research, the tools of legal research and legal understanding of the law and constitutionality, all those things are at play here. And also the lens of, of seeing these type of, of strategies and tactics of targeting communities, particularly marginalized, oppressed, colonized communities, that if we reverse engineer and analyze the situation from that lens, that we're able to like find a path for resistance. And, and, and um, I appreciate the palabras. Maybe I'll take pause there. I think we have some time for reflections and comments. Yeah, I see that uh, Dr. X has his hand up for, uh, for a minute now. So Dr. X, thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, you, wanna, you wanna go ahead and ask your question or comment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Francisco, muchas gracias. I really appreciate your presentation. We're both committed to the same struggle. And uh, 
just wanted to add a little something. I'm, I'm really happy that you brought up San Diego. That's where I'm at. And when you're looking at the gang injunctions out there in Escondido, you know, there's a couple of them that are very problematic because what we're seeing is law enforcement is working together with immigration. So you have Border Patrol going on these, when they're serving these injunctions and there's collateral consequences where while they're serving or they're, they're exploring or they're doing their discovery on certain homies, they also try to ask the immigration status of Raza that live in the same household. So we're seeing the super criminalization of communities by looking at these interlocked police powers, right? And I really love that Santa Bruta, Santa, I wasn't saying Santa Bruta, but Santa Barbara defeated the gang injunctions out there. I heard Oakland also did something very similar. Now, my concern is we need to abolish them all completely because what gang injunctions does, it provides an avenue for legal racial profiling. And as all of you are in here learning about consciousness and, and being pissed off, the next level is what the hell are we gonna do about it? Do we sit here and let our communities fall at the hands of these draconian laws or do we do something about it? So Francisco, I commend you for all the work that you've done. There's also another person um, here, the, the one of the Moreno brothers is present. Oh yeah, there you go. And so like all of you, you know, we're, we're involved in the same struggle, you know, and uh, the, the, the question is, we have to do something about it. We can just be like, oh, pobrecitos and say, oh, that's their struggle. Now, fuck that. We got to do something about it because it affects our communities. It's like we're always getting beat down and that's it. You know, like we, we, we got to be about practice. How do you put into practice what we, what we learn in the classroom? Absolutely. Thank you for that, Dr. X. And, and that's what this class is about, right? Every time I tell you all, it's like, what are you going to do about this? Every paper that you write, there's a little box, that one little box that always says, how are you going to address this issue? Right? So this is about developing your critical consciousness and your agency so that you can understand the things that are happening around you and that they're not normal. It's not okay. And they need to be addressed and that we can't wait for somebody else to come and save us and to address these issues. We have to do it ourselves. Okay, so that, that's what this class is about. So it's about giving you the tools, the language, the knowledge, the lens so that you can see what's going on around us. And I do just wanna clarify that again, like Chavo had mentioned earlier, this isn't about because we're trying to protect or promote or, or we're about gangs and violence. That's not what this is about. What it's about is addressing a very uh, unjust policy that criminalizes people who are not involved in criminal activity. Right, so it's, it's just kind of like this blanket that criminalizes our whole entire neighborhood. So that's that's the issue here. Um, Dr. Moreno, I would like to invite you to speak as well and thank you for joining us. And I do have to let you all know that Dr. Moreno did teach at uh, Cal State Channel Islands for a minute. He actually taught this class. And when I started teaching, I asked him for the syllabus. And so I built on that. So muchísimas gracias for that, for handing down uh, that knowledge and the structure for this class. I appreciate you. Um, do you wanna share anything? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I just uh, finished teaching four classes a day. Right now, I'm on, I'm on East Coast time. So again, it's almost six, almost six o'clock over here. But again, it's been a long day. And I wanted to, I seen it on Facebook, I wanted to support uh, Francisco and, 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 and when he talks about the injunction. Um, I, I organized with Francisco for a very long time in Oxnard. Now we're at different places. Uh, I'm glad that he was able to run down um, the injunction, but also I, I'm glad hopefully he could talk about the question I'm going to ask him is uh, talking about the weed and seed program, because again, before the injunction, we Colonia, actually the neighborhood my family's from, we were under the weed and seed, a federal program that actually we had ties, we found out later had ties with immigration and the FBI because of a different issue, different organizing and uh, something that happened between Francisco and the, and the police. But again, uh, you know, this uh, neighborhood in Colonia, this strong neighborhood in Colonia has been criminalized for, for since day one. Um, and again, if, you, if, you're, if you're from that area, again, you know that it's, it's an area that's isolated from the downtown area by packing houses at one time, and that one time, majority of our culture film. So again, it's a strong Mexican neighborhood, but it's been criminalized. And again, the city continues the different policies to use throughout the history. And the reason I, you know, I spent, um, oh, I spent over decades actually writing about it and still writing about it. And this is why I have the, the uh, Via, Via Oxstar in the behind me here. It's, it was one of the, down, I think it's actually on off uh, C Street. I think, yeah, off C Street in the old part of downtown. But again, um, I think um, the points that Francisco raised are great. I think it's important to organize, to be proactive. Again, 
uh, thanks to the local newspaper that continues to contact us to get inform us what's going on because again, uh, they like to organize in secret. And now we know again, uh, all about how these injunctions work and uh, Preston's because we're doing a great job advocating not just here, but also uh, into, well, nationally and actually in California. That's it. Absolutely, absolutely. I second that. Thank you for those palabras and being here with us. Um, we want to hear your voices, students. So go ahead and unmute when, when you're ready and uh, give your comment, ask your questions. The floor is yours. Don't be shy, y'all, because I'm going to start calling on names. <laughs> I would like to, maybe I seen some people that, that earlier put a thumbs up or something that they were have been impacted by this in some way. Maybe those folks, maybe now they could throw a comment out or something on what was that connection that they were mentioning. And, and great to see you, Profe uh, Moreno. Um, he's, uh, he's being quite uh, humble about it, but my track in becoming a movement organizer uh, started with Jose and uh, and Dr. Moreno here, his his brother, and this young man, this Dr. Moreno here, they sat me down and they talked to, they talked to me about discipline, showing up to meetings on time, and research and organizing. So uh, I much appreciate it. Changed changed my life forever. Twenty five years ago, working with the comrades. But yeah, I throw it out back. So students, those of you who um, raised your hand earlier about uh, uh, your experience with gang injunctions or having it in your neighborhoods or maybe somebody that you know, if you all can speak to that and share a little bit, that'd be great. I mean, I live in a project, so like, we see this every day. And um, like you guys were saying about the Raider shirt, like I'm also a Raiders fan and um, I can't wear my jersey because like I'm scared because I can get jumped or something. And I do want to speak to that as well, right? Because the the quote unquote solution to that is nobody can wear it at all. And you already know that active gang members are gonna wear it no matter what, right? So it just really isolates them and it makes it easier to identify them. So imagine if everybody just wore their jerseys anyway, everybody, then it'd be a lot more difficult to identify people, right? But of course we run the risk of dealing with violence in our own neighborhoods and our own barrios because so many of our um, relatives are, are still mentally colonized, right? So we ha really have to get to the root Right, Banchebe, get to the root of the things and talk about what is causing the poverty that leads into gangs. What is causing all of that? Why does this even happen in the first place, right? And if we don't get to the root of it and we're just really dealing with um, the effects of it, like Nipsey was, was explaining, then we're never gonna get anywhere, right? And, and, and the whole fact about like, well, just stay in your neighborhood, stay out of sight. It's because out of sight, out of mind. Right? If we don't see you, then we don't have to address the real issues. We don't have to address what's really causing this to happen. Um, so just you have to look at things through a critical lens to really understand why certain things are, are taking place while other things aren't, like addressing the root of the problem, right? Um, Karen, you want to go ahead and unmute or Enrique? Thank you for your comments. Yeah, I was just wondering, um, personally for me, I think it's always the, I don't know where to start, you know, to like actually help and make a change. So are there any events, I know because of the pandemic, it's probably going to be like more Zoom or something, but that we can join um, just to, for me to further educate myself and like what I can actually do to like join, I don't know, sign petitions, whatever it is that I can do to do my part. I, I would, I mean, I always um, advance and promote the organizations I follow or I'm a member of. So if you have social media, I would immediately recommend uh, Union del Barrio. Then I, I would definitely would recommend Chicanos, Chicanos Unidas. So if you look them up, I think it's Ch X with an X on both ends, Chicanex uh, Unidos, the Orange County. Uh, Youth Justice Coalition, YJC, you can follow them as well. There's related to this topic, right? Because there's multiple uh, issues out there that we're all organizing around, but related to this topic in particular, 
those three come to mind. Um, California's United for the reform of budget, CURB, C-U-R-B. Um, that's also an, another good one. So if you start following, you'll see that they'll start posting events. Hey, this event is happening, that event, and, for, and a lot of it, mo all of it mostly is all virtual right now. And, um, and so you'll be able to at least, you know, plug in, get yourself on their list, be alerted, and show up to some of their virtual meetings. That's how, that's how I started. I mean, somebody said, hey, there's a Mecha meeting. You want to join? I'm like, what is Mecha? I don't know what that is. I didn't know when I started. And that's kind of what got me started, you know, and, and the Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Aslan. I was like, all right, I showed up to my first meeting, 1994. And I was like, wow, I want to be part of this. And that never turned back since. And that's a great question to end this session with because I always uh, do ask our guest speakers, what can students do to get involved? So that's a great way to get involved. Um, I also asked uh, you, Chavo, in the chat, if you can drop your contact info in case anybody wants to reach out to help you with the work that you're doing. Um, students, you already know you have your agents of change requirement um, for this class. So um, the, these are some really great example that Chavo is, is offering you to just follow these groups and you know just see see if you want to get involved somehow um, or contact him directly to help him with the projects that he has on his desk okay so again if we don't do it ourselves nobody's gonna do it okay so we gotta we gotta protect our own communities um all right everybody so that's our time thank you so much for this enlightening and very informative presentation Chavo. i appreciate you very much brother i appreciate our visitors that are here with us today thank you so much um, and this is this is a lot of really great information. And y'all, um, you already know where to find this video. Um, I'll post it on the YouTube channel, and then you can share it and 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 you know distribute this information to others. Okay. But I'm gonna go ahead and invite you students to go ahead and unmute and give your thanks and your goodbyes. And uh, I'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Hey, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everybody. So much.